So I'd like to warmly welcome Dr. Christy Casa. Thank, thank you so much. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for having me here today. And thank you for kind of getting your coffee and getting back uh, together here. I've loved my time in Trinidad so far, and I'm really grateful to be here today. Um, I am on, right, guys? Yeah. OK, good. I couldn't tell if I was mic'd or not. All right. So we're going to go ahead and spend the next 30 minutes talking about what it looks like in classrooms when we create inclusive environments. And so I, um, I'm a former classroom teacher. I now teach uh, people to be teachers. And I spend all my times in schools really engaging in the practice of what does it look like when we go about the work of creating inclusive classrooms all the way from preschool through college. So I'm going to show you a lot of examples of this today. I'm going to start with a little story about a gentleman named Nick. And so this is my good friend Nick Harmon when he was very young. And um, what he's doing there is measuring a, a car ramp for a science project. And Nick is a young man with Down syndrome. And when he was born, this might not be um, a surprise to many of you, but the doctors when he was born did not have a hopeful message to share with his family. The doctors told the family not to expect much. The doctors told the family to really not worry about Nick um, achieving, that he wouldn't read, that he wouldn't write, that he wouldn't make friends, that he would not um, influence their family in a positive way, and that he certainly would not have a job um, or really accomplish much in life. Well, Nick's mom is an eternal optimist and a very powerful woman. And so she looked at that doctor and said, I'm sorry, but that is not the life my son will have. And so she went about really creating a very different view of what Nick's life would be. And so she took this negative, hopeless message of, uh, of not much opportunity for her son and turned it in to a life full of opportunity. Now, this wasn't easy. She had to fight for this. She had to go to school meetings and insist that her son be included. But year after year in school, Nick was included. He was included in preschool all the way through elementary school. You see here on the slides, he was included in his middle school track and field team. You see him reading. Nick is a great reader. He is a great writer. And then up there in the corner, he is in his high school biology lab and biology class. So included all the way but not because the schools reached out and said, hey, we want to do this, but because Nick's mom made it happen with her vision for her son and her persistence that he be included and be valued. And as that continued through his life, that turned into inclusion in college. And so Nick right now is one of our college students at the University of Colorado, included in classes that everyone else takes, seeking a certificate, um, and you see him here with his ID card. It was a very proud day for his mom and his family as they achieved something that they'd never thought would happen. And so in the face of a, a community and a world that said Nick couldn't do much, Julie, his mother, continued to persist and continued to have this vision. And at times she said, I didn't even believe it myself. I didn't even know what was going to happen. I wasn't sure if I was right. But what I knew is I wasn't going to accept that dismal path that the doctor said on the first day when Nick was born. That was not going to be my child's future. And so every day she had to act as if this was possible. She had to create a new possibility for herself and say, here's how we're going to get there. Here's how we're going to get there. And this is very much the work that I do in schools. As you all know, as you work to include people and fight for the rights of people with disabilities, there are barriers. People say, yeah, but what about this? Oh, that can't happen. This is going to get in the way. And every time we face a barrier, we have to say, here's how we're going to problem solve that. Here's how we're going to go forward. And that's what Julie did. And so he, Nick does go to college, and he does crazy college things like run on inflatable Velcro things and try to stick himself to it and lift weights in the gym, which is a typical thing college kids do. This is a dark picture, but it is him um, presenting in college class, a typical college class at the university, where he is right alongside his typical peers in his innovations class. And this is him in his machine shop class. We have a machine major, and that is a great love of Nick's, is how machines work and operate. And he has a job paying above minimum wage at the, um, at the local car wash, where he works on the machines that run the car wash. And so, you know, Nick is somebody 
who has absolutely achieved. But it's not because the school system said, hey, let's go ahead and do this. It's because his family persisted and his family continued to create these opportunities within the schools. And if we look at the bottom there, there's some words that say the theory of ed elig educability, excuse me. And what that really speaks to is there was a man named Burton Blatt who was a dean at Syracuse University in New York a long time ago in the 1950s, 1960s. And Burton Blatt had this idea that people with significant disabilities could learn. And back then that was a very wild idea that people with significant disabilities, people with Down syndrome could learn. And he said, but you know what, in order to make that so, we have to act as if it's going to happen. So if we want people with Down syndrome to read, what do we have to do? We have to teach them to read. We have to provide the opportunity. We have to provide a literate community. If we want people with Down syndrome to succeed at work, just as Christy has, and I have loved hearing about her story. I don't know if she's in the room or not. But you know, just as Christy has and how Tyrese has, we have to provide those opportunities. We have to provide the support and the vision and the view that they can succeed in those work environments. And that's what Nick has done here, is this idea that yes, he can succeed in college and he can succeed in the workplace and live on his own own and have a great future, but it's because we go about making that happen and not being stopped by the barriers that come in our way. And so this is a big part of this work here, that if we're going to make these things happen, if we're going to go ahead and create opportunities, we have to see people's strengths, we have to see people's abilities, and we have to get with this idea is if we want to see competence, we have to look for it. And that means shedding our prejudice, shedding our, our disbelief, shedding our old ideas that surround disability, and really looking to new futures and new ways of understanding people. And so really want to be with that idea as we kind of go through and look at some of the curriculum and how we modify that and how kids can be included. So what I wanted to first share with you is just a little, you know, uh, quick the video on what has influenced us to keep doing this work. And that is a 35-year body of research that says when we include children with and without disabilities, everyone achieves more. Because I know that is one of the questions. What is gonna happen when you include kids with disabilities in the general classroom? What's gonna happen to the kids without disabilities? What's gonna happen to the children with disabilities? And what we know through our research for the last 35 years is that everyone does better. So let's go ahead and play that. SWIFT, school-wide integrated framework for transformation. All means all. All means all. All means all. All means all. Students without disabilities made significantly greater progress in reading and math when served in inclusive settings. All means all. All means all. Two of them want number two of them. All means all. All means all! A school-wide, multi-tiered system of support emphasizing prevention and teaching appropriate behaviors increases academic engagement for all students and reduces disproportional disciplinary referrals for certain racial and ethnic groups. All means all. 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 All Thirty years of research shows us that all students can participate, learn, and excel within grade-level general education curricula. All means all. All means all. All means all. All. You get that? All. All means all. Learn more about SWIFT at swiftschools.org. You guys can go ahead and switch it now. All right. So the research is clear. I'm going to just, I'm going to tell you about this in a minute, but I'm going to flip forward just a moment. 
So the research we have in the area of inclusion for people with significant disabilities, people with Down syndrome, is absolutely clear. People do better when they're included. They have better academic gains, they have better social gains, better communication gains, problem-solving gains. Across the board, it's clear. I'm going to make my slides available to all of you, and so I'm going to skip over some of this through time, and so I just skipped over a little bit of research, but you'll all be able to take a look at that. But some of the research I do, this was a study in New York that I did, and you see that when we moved from segregated practices to inclusive practices, the enormous gains made by students. And so this is on the statewide reading test data, and then the next slide is, state, uh, slide is our um, high stakes testing data and just enormous gains made by kids when we include them. And this goes for other categories around communication and such as mentioned. And so we've got to really rely on this idea that we have a body of knowledge, we have a body of best practice that can inform the work we're doing. This isn't out of nowhere. This is based in really great work and examining where students are going to do best. And what we also know is that when we want students to have inclusive, productive adulthoods, we have to start when they're young. We have to absolutely be including them from an early age, so that way they can be included as they grow older. So when I think about working towards inclusion, there's a few pieces of it, a few characteristics that I know I have to be with. And so, when I, a lot of people ask me, Christy, what does it take? What does it take to create these successful, inclusive classrooms? And these are the three areas that I really have settled on. So if I want to go about creating inclusion, the first thing I have to do is take action. I have to look around me and say, what is it that I can do to work towards inclusive schooling? And that's something that Glenn and Lisa have certainly done in this Down Syndrome Family Network. They have said, what can I do to help create change? and then action is taken. And so that could be with your local school, it could be with your child getting involved in the community, it can be you as a teacher reaching out and saying, how can I include? It could be you as a student saying, how can I make connections with students with disabilities? How can I bring people into my circle? And then while you're doing that, and this may feel very um, familiar to many of you, is you're gonna have feelings of being uncomfortable. Doing this work of social change is not comfortable. I often do not feel comfortable when I walk into a school and say, I'm going to change everything that you do in here. We are no longer going to segregate the students with disabilities. And guess what? Teachers do not look at me in friendly ways. They are not happy that I am there to do this with them. Now, over time, they learn to be comfortable with me, and we build relationships, and it's very lovely. But the first time I come in and say, nope, you know that separate classroom? We're not going to have that anymore. They're not looking at me like they like me. And so in my body, I feel uncomfortable, okay? So yes, you gotta just be okay being uncomfortable. And then the teachers come to me and they say, Christy, I'm worried. I'm worried I'm not doing it right. I feel uncomfortable. And I say, yep, and I just want you to be with that feeling. You're just gonna manage that feeling of discomfort and you're gonna keep moving forward with the practices that you know are gonna create change. And then the next thing that comes is continuous problem solving. Over the last three years, I've worked to build a, an office that supports people with significant disabilities at the university, people with Down syndrome and other disabilities. And we solve problems every single day. Every day, something goes sideways, something goes wrong, some, there's a bump in the road that we have to solve. And nothing stops us. We just keep solving the problems they come up. And so that's another piece that you have to be with when you're creating inclusion is okay, there's gonna be a barrier, how am I gonna solve that problem? Barrier, solve the problem, and keep going. One of the ways we look to solving those problems when we're building these inclusive classrooms is through this idea of universal design for learning. And I don't know um, if this is a prevalent conversation here, but the idea of UDL has been something we've been working on for quite a while within the United States. And UDL really gives us a framework for how we design our curriculum so that all students can have access. So the graphic up here, what it really represents, and it's from the CAST Center, um, and so if you could go to cast.org and find this information. Um, and what this graphic represents here is really the different ways we want students to be able to access knowledge, make sense of knowledge, and show us what they know. And so how are we bringing knowledge to people? How are we supporting them to process it? 
And then how are we sure, uh, supporting them to give us a product? And so we, it can't just be one way. And we have a traditional way of schooling, at least in the United States, where kids sit in a chair and don't talk, and the teacher talks, and the child's supposed to learn. And what we know is not all kids do no, learn that way. A lot of kids have to have hands-on experiences. A lot of kids have to see it, hear it, feel it, engage with it. And I have to show you what I know in a completely different way other than writing a paper or taking a test. And so UDL, Universal Design for Learning, guides us in that process of being able to do that. And so I thought I'd show you some examples of the classrooms that I'm in and how that looks. And so the first picture you see here is, um, is a way of telling a story. And so you've got the character setting problems, events, and solutions all from uh, the three little pigs, okay? And so the hand and the movable characters on the fingers allow the child to manipulate and show where the, where the um, items go so that the solution is at the end and the characters are at the beginning. And so it's a physical way of manipulating that rather than just speaking about it, okay? A different way in. The picture on the right is a plant cell. I hope, I think I have that correct. I'm not a scientist. Um, but the plant cell, and as you see there, it's a model. Somebody built it. And somebody interacted with it, with their with the little um, toothpicks, and were able to label it in that way. So they didn't have to write about it or draw. They could create it. Again, it's another way to show what I know about this plant cell. It's another way to interact with it. And it's a hands-on learning experience. And so just some examples of universal design. So you see here a group of kids sitting around a table with puppets talking about the story. And the young man with the headphones in the little chair, he's reading the story. Different ways to interact with that content for those, for those children. The one on the left is a student with a visual impairment learning about the water cycle. And she can feel all the different pieces of the cycle. And when she, we asked her questions, she was able to say, and point to the different areas and show that she understood that this was stage one and this was stage two. And then if you see the screen on the, the right, it's a student using some word prediction software in order to type instead of having to paper pencil write out and having words come up in order to support their writing, much as our phones do now these days. So those are just some pictures of different ways that students you know, are able to interact with the content, different ways that we can have them understand and show what they know around these. Um, when we're really looking at how do they access curriculum? Because that's probably one of the most common things I get asked when, they, when I start to do this work of inclusion is, OK, how are you going to include the student with Down syndrome? How are you going to include a student who reads at a first grade level in a sixth grade class? So a student that might have the reading skills of a five-year-old in a classroom where students are 12 years old. How do you do that work, Christy? And so these are some of the ways we do that. We do that through different representations, using technology, and really doing something that we talk about around making modifications. And so this is my friend Lucy here in one of the schools that I work in. And so when Lucy came to middle school, the school did ask, you know, how are we going to include Lucy in science? How are we going to include Lucy in language arts? And so you see her working with a group of partners to do an experiment. And Lucy was able to take visual diagrams and be able to do the steps of the experiment. She had to have some supports in there. We had to have some visual step-by-step -step directions in order for her to know how much solution was she going to measure? How was she going to interact with that? What she's learned and built through this is an incredible um, ability to follow directions, to problem solve when things went wrong, to communicate with her peers. And if you think about that, all of those things are necessary in the workplace. So where's the ground that we're going to teach people in order for them to gain the skills to be productive citizens and to have those skills in the workplace? And those skills are in the general education classroom and in the mix of learning regular curriculum. And so when we think about this idea of universal design, um, you see the two different ways these young students, they were about six years old, were writing their papers. One is full of pictures from a program called Proloquo. It's a, a digital communication app. And then one is a student handwriting. 
And so we can have different ways that students participate in the curriculum in the classroom. I'm not gonna go over this because it's a little detailed, but I wanted you to know it's there. So when I talk about this idea of making modifications, what that really means is taking that general curriculum and how do I make it accessible for people with Down syndrome, for people with more significant disabilities? And we do that through a step-by-step -step process of looking at what the other students are going to learn and looking at what the strengths and the abilities of the person with the disabilities are. And so this will be there for you as a resource in order to kind of look at that and look at the process for how you can make those modifications. This is too small to see, but I'm just gonna let you know what's there. <laughs> Another thing I do when I work with students in the gen ed classroom that are, um, that are going to be needing modifications is I create what's called a modification protocol. And what that is, is you take a look at the child with a disability and their skills, and they say, whenever we're going to be doing reading in this classroom, how is this child gonna participate in it? Whenever we do writing, how is this child gonna participate in it? Whenever we do math, what, how is this child gonna participate in it? And we create a plan for how they'll be included. And so that, when you see this as a resource for yourself, that's what you'll be seeing there, is just an example of a plan for how we can work to include students. And so let's take a look at some examples of modifications here. And so what you see here on the left is um, a six-year-old student that was able to fill in a Venn diagram and draw the pictures in the words themselves. The student on the right here is a student with um, Down syndrome, and you'll see that they dictated and someone else did the writing for them. And so they had what we refer to as a scribe. And so I'm gonna tell you and you're gonna write it down for me. And so they were still able to participate in the content, but someone assisted them with the writing piece. This is a vocabulary test that was modified. So the students without disabilities were writing the definitions of the vocabulary words. This student had pictures that they were able to match. And the pictures had a simpler word on one side that helped them learn the definition. So for example, the card that says enthusiastic, on the back you see it says excited and it has a picture of a kid jumping. That gives them the, the cue that this is enthusiastic. And so it's a teaching tool and a way for them to show their understanding of that content area. While so everyone else is writing their vocabulary test, this student is matching their cards to their vocabulary test. This is a book, a typical book. I think in the United States this file violates copyright laws, but I'm not gonna actually worry about it right now. Um, so what this, this uh, teacher did was rewrite this book in a simpler uh, reading level. And so she made the book easier. Now this actually um, can be done electronically and I'm not exactly sure if it violates copyright laws or not, but it made it so this child could read this book on their own independently. But another way we provide access to books is through digital means, and so audiobooks. So students could be listening to their grade level books rather than having to read them on their own. Again, here's another modification. You'll see in the top corner here, I think this is the, oh, nope this top corner here, that there's a student who wrote about the ladybug, and then you see a student who drew about the ladybug. And so the student who just drew doesn't write. They don't have writing skills yet, but they were able to draw and they were able to verbally say some of the things that they wanted to say about the ladybug and why it was different from the butterfly. And so really what I hope you're seeing is that we can take that regular curriculum and we can change it so that the child can participate. But we still stay on the same topic, so it's not like the child is doing something completely different in the back of the classroom. They're still a part of everything. They just have a little bit different way of interacting with the content. I'm gonna roll through some of these. This is a pretty funny one, so I'll share this one with you. So my friend Nick, who you met at the beginning, he was included all the way through high school. Well, in 10th grade in high school, it's about, I don't know what that's equivalent to here, but it's about 16 years old for us, possibly, 15, 16 years old in the United States. They were asked to write a persuasive essay to persuade their peers to do something. 
And so Nick doesn't write essays. He can write sentences and, you know, two or three sentences together, but not essays. And so his teacher said, I want Nick to learn about persuasion. So how about Nick creates a persuasive PowerPoint where he can write some sentences on each slide and use some pictures. His peers are still going to all write their essay, but Nick's going to do his PowerPoint. Everybody has their computers out, all participating together, discussing this idea of persuasion. So Nick gets started, and he says, my topic is Las Vegas. I want to persuade teenagers to go to Las Vegas. It's like, OK, Nick, this is going to be interesting, OK? And so he goes about and talking about this SEMA car show. His family is a very big car family, and he really liked the SEMA car show. So he wrote some sentences about that. The other thing we teach um, our people to do is to edit and to use, a tech, um, to use a program called Grammarly that will help them edit their work. So Nick's writing did not start off looking that clean, but he was taught to ta get there. And so then he put in his pictures about cars, and he put in his pictures about girls, and he really was able to persuade teenagers to go to Las Vegas. So did Nick learn about persuasion? Yes, he did. Did Nick develop his writing skills? Yes, he did. He developed them for him, not in comparison to his peers, but for him. So just a couple other tools that we use. This is an app called Clicker 7 that's really great for developing writing skills. I use this a lot for a lot of young children with Down syndrome because you can see you just touch the words to create a sentence. I thought I had one more example, but I think I took it out of there. So yeah, you touch the words to create a sentence. And so that's a big piece of what supports students to um, you know, engage in their work. And so as you will have this as a resource, you'll see some other examples of writing and graphic organizers, and this is the photosynthesis um, uh, formula. But you see, I don't have to write it to show you I've learned it. I can put it in order. And so different ways in, again, for students to label rather than have to write parts of a plant or a leaf and a heart, mapping with color coding. And so you'll see all of these in there, um, building an animal cell versus having to draw an animal cell, ways of uh, you know, people to engage in this. And so I want to just kind of leave you with this final vision around this, is all of this work Julie did on inclusion, all of the work she did to help teachers learn to modify the curriculum, to help Nick be included, it really led to this very full life for him. And really because of inclusion, he was ready to go to college. And this is the university where I work and some of the students we serve. And because of inclusion, Students are getting scholarships to go to college. This is actually the John Lynch Fund that's, that uh, provides scholarships for people with intellectual disabilities to go to college. And because of inclusion, students are on campus taking cooking classes right alongside their peers who are in the, at the university and are preparing presentations right alongside of their peers. All of this work because of inclusion is being is being sought after, is being found in ways that we never thought would happen. And so these are a couple of our students, Corey and Mia, who take the hip hop class with all their typical peers on every Friday night. And that's because of inclusion. They're able to access college, go to the hip hop class, study for their exams, which they're all very nervous about right now because we're in the middle of midterms, and, um, and really develop their skills to build a full life. And so I'm not going to, Stephanie, am I at time? Two minutes. OK. I'm going to go ahead and show you We're use this last couple minutes just to look at this. This is a video um, from Swift Schools. And it really kind of encapsulates all that I've talked about here around curriculum and about the value of being together. And so if you want to see the fullness of this video, you can go to swiftschools.org and look at their YouTube channel. But I'm just going to show you a couple minutes of this. So go ahead and click play. We've gone from having 70% of the schools failing it. to it no failing schools. So for the first time in over nah, a decade, a we're proud to say so that no child in the bit. city of Meridian okay. attends a failing school. Uh, nope. Stop it right Lily there. belongs. All right, everyone has a worksheet. Number one, we have all been convinced by others to buy or do things. Who on the list below usually is best at convincing you? Who is second? 
every student has the right to receive instruction with our age-appropriate peers in a general education setting, and it's our job to figure it out. It's not the student's job to figure it out. It's the adult's job to figure it out. And it's hard sometimes. It's all the adults are the ones that get in the way, right? It's not the kids. The kids don't ever get in the way. The kids live up to your expectations. So if you expect them to be peers with each other, they're peers with each other. How do you think respect plays a role in someone being able to persuade you? Lily, what do you think? Do you think it's easy? Easy. So you think you could convince Jackson to give you his last piece of gum? No. But well, you guys are good friends, aren't you? Yep. Yep, that's what I thought. Okay. You sit right here. Lily wants you to. And Lily, 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 Lily wants people that she wants. I think Lily belongs in our classroom because she is wonderful and she likes to make friends and she is nice to everybody. She respects everybody around her. She respects the teachers, she respects her things. And it shows us, like, she's like a role model for us. You have a good day. Right, and you are the guardians. Yeah. I mean, I don't think we would have had it any other way, right? I mean, it's just socially, it, you know, she's just another kid in the crowd, which is a really big deal for us, right? <laughs> okay. If you, yep, stop it right there. Awesome. So you just got a little glimpse of Lily in the classroom, of the kids valuing her, of the work she's able to do, of how she can be in the, uh, engaged in the curriculum. And like I said, you can check out more of that, which is really exciting. But one thing that's really notable to me is the young man without a disability, his reaction. That of course Lily belongs, that she you know, is it's supportive to us, that she's a role model for us. That attitude comes because of the adults around him. When the adults work to include and respect children, the children will come right along with it. And so they were taught to value, taught to uh, respect, and then they grow up with that. And then what happens to your workplaces? They become more inclusive. Your communities come become more inclusive because children have had that experience. And so I just wanted to leave you with this final thought that really getting with this idea that we cannot know what's possible ahead of time. We have to take all of our passion and all of our drive for the disability rights movement and for the inclusion of people with disabilities, and we have to go about engaging and making that happen. So thank you so much for having me here today, and I look forward to talking more this afternoon. I don't have it up there.